Now let's move on to the next session. We we won't shortchange you, Mike, on your on your time. So we will go to uh, morning tea at uh, at ten thirty, ten minutes later than scheduled. So Mike can have his time. Mike uh, Rogers, upper GI surgeon from Wider Matter, um, is going to talk to us about some of the experiences that Wider Matter have had along this safe surgery journey. And I have no idea specifically what I was going to talk about, so it'll be very interesting for all of us. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Ian. And uh, I suspect I'm the light relief after that, Cliff. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today was uh, our implementation of the surgical safety checklist, which I'm assuming everybody in the room knows in all too much detail uh, and has uh, probably had their own struggles uh, with this program championed by the HQSC and of course by Ian and Alan Mary and company. And uh, it was very useful, Ian, for you to ask who, who's in the room because it's a little bit hard to know where to pitch things and what people's background knowledge is on these things. So I'm going to say some things that probably many of you already know. But then I'm going to delve into some of my own personal thoughts about um, how we go about implementing things. Does everybody know what that is? Ian does. Everybody knows what that is? Yep. Yes? Okay, so Flying Fortress. The uh, Supposedly, um, when I got told the story, it crashed on its maiden flight and that was in front of all the generals and that was bad. As far as I can tell from my own research, that's not actually true. The maiden journey went just fine. It was the second flight in October 1935 where it crashed. Uh, but that was, as uh, I'm sure you're probably aware, was almost the end of Boeing as a company um, and they had to rescue the, the situation thereafter. In fact, apparently they did something quite illegal to get back into the program. Um, there was a shortcut uh, done to enable this uh, machine to eventually be built and... Uh, supposedly helped win the war. I'm not sure how true that actually is. But that was the basis, uh, again, supposedly, and I, I'm quite interested to look at this a little bit more deeply because I'm not sure I entirely believe that was where we got checklists from, but apparently what you uh, needed on that plane was gust controls, yeah? And they were basically to tag down the movable bits of the wing that were used for adjusting your... Um, elevation and all the things that pilots in the room will know more about than I do. And they didn't loosen them off, or a number of them weren't loosened off before it took off, and hence it went to a steep climb, flipped over, crashed, and the two on board died. Um, so the theory is, is that the basis behind that was because they were dealing with increasingly complex aircraft in the same way the analogies made, of course, in medicine, increasingly complex systems. And the human brain doesn't deal with complexity terribly well. We uh, deal with habit, we're quite good at that. Uh, but high complexity systems are difficult to deal with, particularly at an individual level. And as a course, the basis for teamwork as opposed in the operating room as opposed to the individual surgeon knowing everything and dictating all that's going on because the reality is one person just can't deal with that. As um, Cliff alluded to, Data is king in this, of course, and uh, I'm sure you're also all, f all familiar with the uh, Atul Gawande's um, paper um, and, of course, Alan Mary's contribution to that uh, at Auckland Hospital um, to produce, you know, uh, a, a seminal paper on uh, the effect of um, checklist methodology and uh, morbidity and mortality in surgical populations. And that, of course, is the, the results graph, but the... But I wanted to point out, is there anyone from Auckland Hospital at this thing? One, well, two, three. So, okay, we've got some representation, but the key thing there is what I've put in red is that Auckland Hospital itself, the mortality rate dropped from 1.4% to 0.3%, so almost went down to a third of its previous levels, or is it, no, sorry, a quarter. And the complication rate dropped in half. So if uh, there was ever any question, and I'm sure Auckland Hospitals must be a champion of the checklist, um, they have their own data, so th there's no argument for them. Uh, there is some arguments you can make about statistical significance in the first world versus the third world and uh, other things. And, of course, the easiest thing to do if you don't want to engage in um, the checklist is to uh, question that data. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what I wanted to talk about um, primarily in this was 
achieving buy-in, and I guess that's uh, when Cliff was talking about culture is what we're uh, leading into with that. And uh, as you know, HQSC led the implementation of this, and Alan Mary will have a huge personal stake in this, uh, although that won't be his primary motivation. But what I was going to ask the audience is, in a theatre group, um, with all players involved, uh, who in that group is least likely to buy into some sort of change, such as implementation of a checklist? Surgeons. <laughs> well, there's a surprise answer. But my question to you is, why? Yeah, I, I, I don't think for a moment believe surgeons are any less interested in the welfare of their patients than anyone else. In fact, I'd suggest... You know, given what we, we were hearing about dedication to the cause, people take vacations to go and work in the third world. I know nursing staff and everyone else does similar things, but why? Why would you resist something that's going to halve your complication rate and get you down to a quarter of your mortality rate, even if you have some doubts about it and want to see repeat studies and all the rest of it? And I don't know, have you thought about why that might be for surgeons? Well, I think I know one reason why, and I guess I'm a surgeon myself. But I'd point to what I think is a universal problem, and it's called cognitive dissonance. And you're probably familiar with this. And here we go. If your numbers are correct, my strategic plan is irrational. Spoink goes the brain. Cognitive dissonance takes over. You're sure bad with those numbers. Okay. So what, the, what, what, what he's doing is he's saying the data must be crap because how can my plan be wrong? We do this all the time, every day, all of us here, everybody in the world who's a human being does it all the time. And if you haven't read this book, read it. Uh, mistakes were made, but not by me. Why we justify foolish beliefs, bad decisions and hurtful acts. Fantastic book by a couple of psychologists about cognitive dissonance across all fields, including medicine, politics, um, couple relationships, about how we go around self-justifying. And the basic principle is we can't deal with, we feel pain, mental anguish, when we are trying to hold two different concepts in mind. Most of us think we're rational, good people, trying to do our best. So if somebody presents you with something that is contrary to that, you have to do one of two things. You either have to accept that you're not rational, a good person trying to do your best, or you have to do something about what's being presented to you, either ignore it, selective uh, use of evidence, uh, minimise what's going on, whatever. So let's think of what's happening to a surgeon, or, and I have to say this, it applies to your anaesthetic tech or your nursing staff or anybody else. You've gone through a lot of training. What, what would be your self-view? And I, I challenge anybody not to have this view who's in that operating room. Uh, perhaps the medical student or student nurse doesn't yet, but they will do. They're highly trained. I am a highly trained, experienced professional. No question that's true. I'm a leader. No question that'll be true. I know what I'm doing. Done this many times before. Have huge experience. I'm trustworthy. You don't, you know, I'm here to do the best I can and help the patient. There's no doubt that everybody in that room is thinking that. And my views matter. Why? Because of all these other things. You know, what I think about what's going on in this operating room matters. I have a valid point of view. Okay, so Ian comes along with surgical safety checklist and says, here you go, you need to implement this. Sorry, Ian, I'm paraphrasing, I'm sure you don't say that. <laughs> what is that actually saying to that everybody in that room? Well, I'd suggest this is what you're actually saying to them by saying you need a checklist. You need to be checked on. You can't be trusted. Some higher authority is in charge of what's happening in that operating room. And your views on this don't really matter because you're going to do this whether you like it or not. Now, there's no way that would be stated, but I can tell you what, a lot of people would hear that regardless of how it's stated. And this, I think, is the nub of why, particularly surgeons, but I suggest uh, there'd be other professionals in the room who'd have the same sort of process going through their mind. This is a cognitive dissonance. If I'm on the top part, how is this bottom part true? So what am I going to do about that? Well, here you go. You can resolve that dissonance in a number of negative ways. You can attack the data. Atul Gawande was wrong. He just had it wrong. The significant intervals on that data was wrong. It's not applicable to my hospital. Auckland Hospital's got a problem. North Shore Hospital certainly doesn't. You can point out the downsides of trying to implement something like this. It's a waste of time. We've got more important priorities. You can deflect. 
go on to some other subject. Well, what about X, Y, Z? That's far more important. You can just, and this I guess is getting to the left side of that last picture Cliff was showing, you can refuse. You can just say, look, I am not following orders from this person, group, whatever. I'm the one in charge, go away. Or, and I think this is the, the hardest one to deal with actually, is you can just ignore it. You can let it happen in the background, you can let somebody else deal with it, you can just forget about the whole thing. That's just not part of my life. If you want to do that, off you go and do it. I'm going to ignore you. That's really, really hard to deal with. So some, we, we, when I got involved um, as Chief of Surgery, we had a, a, a mini flame war um, with a group email, as you do, uh, which I had to douse at one point. Um, but here are some quotes that are, that are relevant, I think. So the direct quotes from clinicians. This will most certainly increase theatre time, which we don't have, by the way. Instead of writing notes and dictating and so on, I will be waiting for the patient to be anaesthetised to do the time out, not a good use of my time, as I see it. Okay, so I'm important. I don't have time to waste. Nobody's got time to waste. This is a waste of time. And how about this one, which is fairly mild, really, but interesting and prepare to do it as long as you realize because of course we wouldn't have thought about this it will increase anesthesia time on my list of 10 patients today five minutes per patient will be at least one case so this is going to take 50 minutes over the course of the day and deflection how many times does the patient get a check-in before they get into the theater three or four times at least and they still had the wrong patient in the wrong theatre, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. That speaks of a lot of other things than doing a timeout, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. It's a lot of exclamation marks and obviously a lot of passion in that statement. Is it relevant? No. Yes, there's a whole lot of other things we need to fix. Absolutely. This is deflection in its purest form. So what do we do? What are we tempted to do? Well, what we usually do is we feed the dissonance. So we encourage it, um, and not usually to good effect. So, well, we can say, this is the way it will be. I'm chief of surgery, you're just going to do it. We can give the checklist to the most junior person in the room to uh, do, which is what we did at North Shore Hospital for a while. What is that saying to everybody else in the room about the importance of that process? I'm not saying that most junior person in the room isn't a perfectly valid person to do it, but you're implementing something new. What are you saying? What's the chances of them actually speaking up and making sure that happens or anybody taking it with the full seriousness? Or we can say, well, Dr. Smith, what a prick. <laughs> he will not implement this thing. He needs to be told to buck up his ideas or fired, whichever comes first. Or, and I suggest this uh, is unlikely to work with surgeons, you could point out how flawed their thinking is, that they're not thinking logically, that they're not caring about the patient or X, Y, Z. Now, from a cognitive dissonance point of view, I mean, apart from just pure practical human point of view, what you're doing is you're feeding the dissonance. So the only way you can respond to that from a dissonance framework is to go on the attack, to defend, to deflect more. You can't actually take any of that and resolve the dissonance between I'm actually a good professional doing my best and I, I, I think this is a waste of time. None of that works, but I, it's all been tried. I thought this was a, a good example of the, the, the command and control structure, uh, or at least this was how it's interpreted. What, what does not work is the charge nurse handing you the consent form and the checklist and making you do this yourself before the tech even touches the patient or begins to put the monitors on. Likewise, a surgeon was forced interesting, to stand next to the charge nurse so he could read directly from the consent form. And I had to remind him not to deserialize himself in this process. This just does not seem right. So, you know, I'm sure there are more, more than one viewpoint on how that particular interaction happened, but command and control, not surprisingly, generating a, a lot of angst and doubtless a lot of resistance to the whole process. So how could we actually use dissonance to get things done? And I, I'm thinking about this a lot because I, I have to do this. And I think what I would suggest is that you use the way people view themselves, or you can expect the way they would view themselves, to um, 
uh, persuade them that there's congruence between what you're asking them to do and what they see as themselves. And the ones I'd suggest is, first off, I'm an evidence-based practitioner. If there's a any surgeon or I suspect any health professional who doesn't consider themselves evidence-based these days, it would be extremely rare. Um, I'm a member of a respected profession. I'm a professional. I'm part of a group of professionals. We all have standards. Patient welfare is my first priority. Uh, as, I, as I say, you know, if we're having a, a meeting or a discussion, the first thing we should be talking about is the patient, and then the patient, and then the patient. And for the end of the meeting, we're not saying about anything that's helping the patients. Why are we having the meeting? I'm a leader. I'd suggest all four of these can be used uh, probably to implement anything, uh, not as a fail-safe, but certainly worth trying. So when, when that um, uh, flame war was going on, you all know Godwin's law, don't you? Surely. The longer that an uh, internet conversation goes on, the more likely somebody will make reference to the Nazis, usually to the person that they don't like. And that's probably true of a group email conversation at the hospital as well. I haven't actually seen it get to the Nazis yet, but certainly the exclamation marks start growing in number. So with that conversation, I did a little bit of data collection in three patients and emailed back to everybody. Well, actually, when I did the timeout, it took 29 seconds for the first patient, 28 seconds for the second patient, and a minute, seven seconds for the last patient. And in fact, the reason it took so long was because we identified an allergy to augmentin in that patient that no, neither the surgeon or the anaesthetist knew anything about. So we had a positive result just out of that random afternoon. Uh, nobody responded to that, but what I was trying to do was use data and evidence, much like a, a much smaller level that we, we have with our, our trials, to um, appeal to the evidence-based part of the professionals we're talking to. What about professional respect? Well, here's Ian. Sorry, Ian, the only photo I could find. So what we do with Ian, you know, this is a, a person at the top of the profession in New Zealand and uh, Australia as well to a large extent, coming along and being the role model, doing the talk, and he, he's come along, I suspect, to most of our hospitals to uh, talk about the checklist. What that's really doing, in my view, is telling the surgeons, here's one of your most respected surgeons saying this, if you're part of this professional group, you would have dissonance if you don't agree with what they're saying on this. Okay, You'd have to resolve that once some way. You could say, well, actually, I knew him when he was a registrar and he was a real dwarf, so I'm not going to listen to him. Or you'd have to say, well, yeah, you know, it's a bit, bit harder to go. But what was more interesting in a way, because that's probably self-evidence, is we found that the junior doctors who are more open, I guess, uh, sometimes to some of these things, when we got them engaged, the seniors started learning off them. And uh, by that I mean the junior doctor would be saying, oh, it must be time for the time out. And the senior doctor would go, yeah, I guess so. And off they'd go. So it actually works uh, at both ends of the uh, professional spectrum. And what about patient welfare? Well, it's not just Atul Gawande's paper now, is it? Uh, this is the, the Netherlands uh, study of two hospitals comparing 2,200 patients with and without the surgical safety checklist and a halving of the complication rate. It's quite hard to argue with. The mortality reduction didn't reach statistical significance, although it did in one of the hospitals when analysed independently. But this is a well-conducted, randomised trial, level one evidence very hard to argue with and it was with great glee when this was finally published that I uh, emailed out the abstract to all the SMOs, okay? So, and nobody responded. So I guess they either didn't read it or they went, oh well, there you go, case closed. Leadership, I am a leader. So what, what we've done at North Shore and probably other people have done the same is uh, assign leadership roles to each part of the timeout process. So the anaesthetist, the surgeon and the nurse. And that's worked a lot better, I think it's fair to say, uh, in terms of uh, engagement. So that, that was all about buy-in. The other thing I want to talk about in 30 seconds um, is measuring the right thing. And uh, what is not the right thing is... Um, check boxes. And it's a truism, isn't it? What you measure is what will get done. And if you measure tick boxes being ticked, 
what will happen is tick boxes will be ticked, and that's all. It doesn't mean anything about anything to do with tick boxes. And uh, if I can be indulged for a second, uh, you know, the, the, the one that uh, came up uh, not so long ago when I was on the ward, I don't know, do you do these hourly round things you're aware of on the wards where the nurses have to go and see the patient every hour? And how do we know they're doing that? Because they tick a box that says they've done it. And so, uh, uh, and it's on the front of, in our hospital, it's actually on the window of the four-bedded room that tick, 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 tick. So, um, of course, you can imagine what happens at the beginning of the shift, tick, 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 tick. Why would incredibly efficient, good use of time, you've ticked the boxes. Okay, you've done it before you even did anything, but okay, we can go around and say that it's been done. And that's exactly what happens every time we tick boxes as an um, outcome. And Ian presents some data on that in Wellington. So we're, we're now, and I, I imagine other people are as well, we have a, a paperless checklist, so there's nobody sitting there ticking boxes. This is the poster that's up on the wall for the timeout. So there's the sign in, the timeout, the sign out, separate posters on the wall. And we all turn to it, or I certainly do, every case to remind myself what am I supposed to be uh, uh, actioning, and we do it. And of course that's what pilots do in planes, okay? Nobody cares when the plane's gone down whether the tick boxes are ticked, but they certainly care about checking everything. So the way to deal with it if you're not ticking boxes and not measuring that is observational audit. And the problem with it, well the good thing about it is it measures what you're actually doing. So you go and actually watch what they're doing and engage it. But it does require resource. And the way we've been doing this is for all the theatres in the block for a week having, I think it's eight observers going in, observing different parts of the checklist and, and marking it off. It's labour intensive. We were doing it six weekly, we're going to go to three monthly. Uh, it may not fit in with requirements to port, report vast amounts of data because you end up with you know, 27 cases or, or something in, in your audit. But nonetheless, I believe, is much more likely to achieve what you want to achieve. And so lastly, just looking at what we have achieved, if you look at the sign-in component, so in a four-tiered system, it's, it's all good. Uh, the the timeout, 96% of the timeout is being led by the surgeon. And a level of engagement in performing the sign out, pretty good. I'd have to say this is the weakest part of the whole system, typically, because people are distracted and wanting to go and do something else. Uh, but it's quite important. We had a um, gallbladder left in the patient a couple of years ago now and wasn't picked up by the sign out because it wasn't done properly. Um, and the patient had to be put back to sleep and their gallbladder taken out. So it's a, it can be a serious issue. Yeah, sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, Problems for the future, how do we deal with fatigue and how do we turn this into business as usual? I actually, my, my sense is it is just becoming business as usual and I don't, I'm not actually too concerned about that. How do we demonstrate that we're actually doing, having a measurable effect? I don't think we're going to be able to. Once it's business as usual, it's embedded, we're not going to see any changing effect over time and that could be disincentivizing for some people. And I guess the bigger picture and we're going to be talking about with briefings is what are the next steps in um, improving and developing theatre culture. Thanks very much. Well, why the matter, you've got a great clinical leader there because that was a truly inspirational presentation, very thoughtful and, uh, and really absolutely goes to the heart of the issues that we are trying to address in healthcare in New Zealand and, and the health quality and safety commission so thank you mike uh